the headquarters of the global car and motorcycle group BMW in Munich. In 1918, an obstetrician from Vienna appeared in the company's history. The financial juggler Camillo Castiglioni. Without Castiglioni, the BMW brand wouldn't exist today. The soldier of fortune with Italian roots pushed to the top. Soon BMW belonged to him all alone. Camillo Castiglioni was certainly one of the great speculators of the 1920s. He was probably the richest man in Europe for a while. In the First World War, Castiglioni, known as the Imperial Royal Arms Supplier, became rich. He knew no inhibitions. Castiglioni was like a character from the movies. He was a genius, a megalomaniac and an adventurer. Castiglioni's life revolved around profit in the circle of politicians and dictators. But his heart also beat for art. He bought the Wiener Theatre in Josefstadt for the famous director Max Reinhardt. He did everything for the actress Iphigenia Buchmann. He even built her a private theatre in his palace. <laughs> My uncle was fascinating, very elegant, and he knew what women like. Castiglioni challenged fate several times. Until in the Nazi era, it was all about survival for him. The Grundel say, in Alsail and in Styria. The villa on the southern shore is a romantic eye catcher for holiday makers and locals. It was already like that in 1920, when Camillo Castiglioni had his eye on the picturesque noble family property. The owner at that time, Eric Urie Lavendal, was threatened with social decline. He therefore sold the holiday home to Castiglioni. But the richest man in the country at that time didn't pay with money, but with shares of a bank that belonged to him. Urie Lavendal hoped that he'd invested his sales proceeds profitably. Castiglioni was building the villa into a palatial holiday residence, visible to all from afar. In his refuge by the lake, the bank boss was a family man. Bitte schön, Herr Präsident. Danke, Franz. Ja, hallo, meine kleinen Prinzessinnen. Gott, Herr Präsident, ich habe den Garten nach Vordermann gebracht und ich glaube, die gnädige Frau erwartet Sie schon. Das will ich doch hoffen. Wie schön. Vielen Dank. Castiglioni was proud of his third wife, Iphigenia Buchmann. She was a young Berg theatre star when the two married in 1916. But the stage career of Iphigenia, who was 16 years younger, was now over. Iphigenia's new role, that of a mother and billionaire's wife. Iphigenia had a mate for herself, and there were three other chambermaids running around. The residence at Grundlsee became the setting for upper-class summer retreats. But the millionaire couldn't and wouldn't rest on his wealth. For him, the poker game for power and wealth was like an addiction. Trieste, long before the First World War. For Austria-Hungary, the port city was the gateway to the world. 
This was where Camillo Castiglione developed his hunger for success as a capitalist. In 1879, he was born into a respected Jewish family as the son of a mathematics teacher. Trieste was a springboard back then for many who wanted to be high achievers. It is understandable that in such a world, the urge ripens in a young man and son of a rabbi to achieve something in life. In the first proper job he had, he was a representative for a rubber factory in Istanbul. From there he came back so successfully that when this factory later became Zemperet in Vienna, he was handed the management of the export department. In 1909, at the age of 30, Castiglioni was already sitting in the executive chair of the tire manufacturer Semperit. Because the company also produced balloon hulls, he became enthusiastic about airships and he flew in a motor-driven steerable balloon around St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna. The flight brought Castiglione to the attention of Emperor Franz Josef and close contacts with influential officers. Soon thereafter, he got his flying license and he insisted that the monarchy rely militarily on airplanes. In order to be better regarded in the anti-Semitic officer circles, he also changed religion. After the death of his rabbi father, he turned his back on Judaism and became a Protestant in 1911. Castiglione quickly made a name for himself in the armaments industry. With a lot of skill and elbow technique, the daredevil founded his own aircraft production from the ground up. Castiglione practically became the sole ruler of the Austrian aircraft industry during the war. In the Castiglione aircraft, the pilots of the squadron of Tyrolean war eagles also flew into the battle zone. They were supposed to scout out Italian positions and drop bombs. Castiglione delivered around 3,000 airplanes till 1918. The war made him a multi-millionaire. During his rapid ascent, Castiglione was assisted by a woman, the former Semperit accountant, Hermina Koblischek. He went all out for his Hermina Castiglione. In 1917, he helped her buy a villa from the Daimel family of Viennese confectioners. For Koblischek, a suitable spouse was found. He was later adopted by the German Baroness Falkner von Sonnenberg. With this, not only he, but also his wife Hermina, were given a title of nobility. The new Baroness was not only Castiglione's closest advisor, but also his heartthrob until Iphigenia Buchmann stepped into his life. A few weeks before the end of the First World War, Castiglione succeeded in a major coup at the Bayerische Motorenwerke. At that time, no cars were produced in Munich, only aircraft engines. They were technically outstanding, but BMW's management was incompetent and therefore ripe for replacement. Castiglione seized this opportunity. In August 1918, he took control of BMW and put the company on a new footing as a public limited company. He was also the one who attracted other financial investors. Without Castiglione, this corporation wouldn't have existed, and thus BMW would certainly not have survived the First World War, but would have gone bankrupt. A few weeks after the deal, however, the First World War was lost. Austria and Germany were no longer allowed to build powered aircraft. That was what the Saint-Germain Peace Treaty said. 
Thus, Castiglione had to switch to civilian product lines at BMW, the production of motorcycle drives, car sign and air pressure brakes. In Austria, on the other hand, Castiglione had a better chance at a new start. Here he managed several car manufacturers for quite some time. First and foremost, the noble brand Ostro Daimler, which later became Steyr Daimler Puch. Castiglione was far more than a speculator. He was a very good industrialist in his early days and had the ambition to play a major role everywhere. The main owner of Ostro Daimler was Castiglione. His general director there, a certain Ferdinand Porsche, who years later became legendary as a VW Beetle designer. In the early 1920s, Porsche and Castiglione shared a common vision, the motorization of society. Ostro Daimler cars won many races. The centrifugal characteristics were tested on the company premises in Wiener Neustadt. However, sales slump due to the economic crisis. In 1923, Castiglione and his investor colleagues demanded savings. Every third job at Ostro Daimler was cancelled. After a fatal racing accident, Castiglione also cut the budget for Porsche racing cars. There was a big fight between the friends. Fabio. And then Porsche left the company with a curse on the Jewish owners. Companions that left wouldn't bring a man like Castiglione off his course, because in the meantime, he had the World War winning power Italy behind him. The former arms supplier for the fight against Italy changed sides in 1919. Born in Trieste, he became an Italian citizen. He skillfully stalked the democratic government in Rome. Then he supported the future fascist dictator, Benito Mussolini. In Austria, Castiglione received mockery and malice for it. In caricatures, he was taken for a ride. It was different in Italy. Here, many Jews were also followers of the Duce. It may seem strange, but fascism was a patriotic movement for many Italians and many Italian Jews at that time. Castiglione had no fear of contact either. He therefore worked for a major Milanese bank as a door opener throughout Central Europe. In the name of Banca Commerciale, and also on his own account, he accumulated strategic company investments. Among them were large share packages of the Styrian electricity supplier Stiwiag and the steel producer Alpina Montan in Donowitz. Decades later, Alpina would merge into the first Alpina technology group. Castiglione undertook his shopping tours from Vienna or Bad Alsay in a luxury rolling office, the former saloon carriage of Emperor Franz Josef. In 1924, the Duce honors Castiglione's services as a wheeler dealer. Mussolini rewarded Castiglione by awarding him the Grand Cross with orders, the country's highest order of merit at the time. In 1918, the dignitary had already acquired an impressive residence in Vienna. The palace of the old and childless art collector Eugen von Miller zu Eichholz. Fabelhaft. <laughs> Castiglione not only came here to an aristocratic palace with Italian Renaissance design, he also acquired an important art collection, which he expanded through large-scale acquisitions. 
Any nouveau riche tried to give himself the appearance of tradition and old wealth, with old furniture and paintings. This is exactly what the nouveau riche Castiglioni tried. As if his family, his house Castiglioni, had already been 200, 300 years old. In Castiglioni's heyday, Austria was plagued by an enormous inflation crisis. The price increases were horrendous. In 1923, a kilo of potatoes cost 11,000 times as much as in 1914. At the Castiglioni's, on the other hand, intoxicating celebrations took place. The host ensnared Christian social and greater German politicians, as well as civil servants and journalists, with discreet donations. The fine society, however, remained predominantly at a distance. It didn't overcome being declassified by an upstart. Others, on the other hand, were impressed. They let Castiglioni live high because he had become rich on his own merit. Many of his contemporaries, however, were not at ease about how Castiglioni could profit from the inflation mess. His starting advantage, he was able to make his war profits in Switzerland before the fall of the monarchy. With this foreign exchange cushion, Castiglioni could show off after 1918. By taking over the prestigious Allgemeine Depositenbank in Vienna, speculating against the Austrian national currency, the Krone, and buying company shares in series on credit, knowing full well that inflation and the decline of the Krone would make the repayment of his loans and tax debts a snap. Castiglioni and other inflation profiteers used the monetary devaluation at that time quite legally for profit. Castiglioni was the greatest of those guys who became infinitely rich in a time of impoverishment. But the fact that Castiglioni boasted of his success often caused resentment. Could such a nouveau riche win the sympathy of the population? No, not really. Many attacked him, especially the socialists and the tabloids. Castiglioni became a charming figure who was accused of financial hocus-pocus. Left anti-capitalists and right-wing anti-Semites demonized him as a bloodsucker. In order not to be labeled a predator capitalist, Castiglioni acted as a patron of the arts. In 1923, he succeeded in bringing star director Max Reinhardt to Vienna. Castiglioni bought the rundown theater in Josefstadt and had it generously renovated for Reinhardt. The co-founder of the Salzburg Festival now also became Josefstadt director. At theatre parties, Castiglioni also spoilt the members of the ensemble. <laughs> Castiglioni served, for example, a large bowl with real Russian caviar. And the caviar was served with a tablespoon. That was a sensation for us, of course. Max Reinhardt, who became famous in Berlin, now also had a theatre in his Austrian homeland. So, bitte schön. Herr Castiglioni. Viele Theaterdirektoren würden sich so einen Eigentümer wünschen wie Sie. Castiglioni felt honoured, but sometimes Reinhardt was also ungrateful. Reinhardt wrote to his partner, Helena Timig. It's a pity that a foreign body like Castiglioni is sitting in the Josefstadt, and we can't be the sole masters of the house. 
in the spring of 1924, overwhelming events occurred. The opening of the theater was overshadowed by a financial crash. Castiglione and other financial gamblers had gambled away enormous sums in foreign currency speculation against the French franc. The huge losses were a fiasco for Castiglione. The deposit bank in which he had long been in charge goes bankrupt. Thousands of savers and investors lost their money in the bankruptcy scandal. And so businesses came to light which were highly problematic for Castiglione. If they really had led to a trial, he'd ended up in prison. Then, September the 27th, 1924, the Castiglionis were exchanging gossip as a valet delivered a message. Da steht, dass ich morgen von der Polizei abgeholt werden soll. Ich soll dem Untersuchungsrichter vorgeführt werden. Castiglione got the tip from his informants in the security apparatus. Without further ado, he set off for Italy. Camillo, schick mir ein Telegramm, wenn du in Sicherheit bist. Wenn dich jemand fragt, wo ich bin, sage ich bin auf einer Dienstreise. A number of newspapers saw Castiglione's disappearance as an indication that he was actually involved in fraud. After two managers from the Castiglione headquarters committed suicide, the case became an economic whodunit. But Castiglione kept his nerve. He got support from Italian government offices in Rome, and the Italian ambassador in Vienna intervened in his favor. The Italian state protected him, not only because he was an Italian citizen, but also because he had political influence abroad and was important for the Milano Banca Commerciale's business there. Castiglione returned to Austria with a rescuing credit from this bank. He had enough money again to avert a lawsuit and to reach a settlement with his plaintiffs. Castiglione, Castiglione was a crook. He ignored all moral, ethical and also legal regulations. And yet he managed never to stand trial, never to be imprisoned. So he was actually brilliant in that way. Also er war in der Beziehung eigentlich genial. But financially, the deposit bank scandal was fatal for Castiglione. He had to watch his empire, which encompassed more than a hundred companies, break down. Whatever factories, banks, newspapers, hydroelectric power plants and steel companies had belonged to him, he had to surrender most of them. Many art treasures from his collection also came under the hammer at home and abroad. But Castiglione wasn't yet finished. For he still had one iron in the fire, and that was BMW. For two years, the company temporarily belonged to the Munich company Knorr Bremser, before Castiglione bought it back. Now he wanted to make an all-out effort again with Bayerische Motorenwerke and make up for the millions lost. The moment was right. BMW was the leading German manufacturer of heavy motorcycles and sidecar machines. In addition, Germany was again allowed to manufacture aircraft engines. Since 1924, BMW had been the most important supplier for the Communist Soviet Union. But the fact that BMW still belonged entirely to the Italian Castiglione went against the grain of the German military. 
Germany and the Soviet Union had common rearmament plans. That's why German National Reichswehr officers wanted to remove the foreign BMW sole owner and supervisory board boss from the top management. BMW was part of the secret cooperation between the Reichswehr and the Red Army. And of course, they were afraid that Castiglione would pass this information on to Italy. And Italy was of course a country with which they had been at war just a few years previously. And so they were afraid that secrets would be betrayed and thought Castiglione was highly unreliable. In 1926, the military and officials in the Reich Ministry of Transport decided to get rid of Castiglione with the help of an intrigue. The ministry threatened BMW with the loss of its public contracts if Castiglione didn't sell half of his BMW shares on the stock exchange. Castiglione gave in and also vacated the executive chair on the supervisory board. Deutsche Bank took over the Castiglione shares and became co-owner of BMW. In October 1928, Castiglione traveled to America with Franz Josef Popp, the Austrian BMW general director. The boom in cars there encouraged them that Bayerische Motorenwerker had to set up its own car production as soon as was possible. At the end of 1928, the deal was perfect. BMW bought a vehicle factory in Eisenach, Eastern Germany. Here, an English small car was assembled under license, the Ossin Dixie. This was BMW's entry into the automotive industry, which gave BMW the chance to become the concern they are today. The Dixie became a successful model. After only one year, the small car, then under the new name BMW 315, was at the top of German car registrations. As late as 1928, BMW participated in a winter rally in South Tyrol with the Dixie. The car manufacturer had also arrived in four-wheel motorsport. Castiglione already had the German automotive industry in mind in order to be able to stand up to US car giants Ford and General Motors in terms of production costs. Castiglione was actually planning to merge Daimler and Benz with BMW, also mergers with Opel. He thought that only if he sold lots of cars would he be successful. Even today it's said that automobile manufacturers need a certain size. These plans at the beginning of 1929 were nothing but smoke and mirrors. Castiglione was once again caught up by his past. Within BMW, commissions were exposed which Castiglione, in his time as the sole owner, had charged the Russian military customers illegally. However, he hadn't stopped this practice after the BMW initial public offering and thus embezzled income that Deutsche Bank and the other shareholders would have been entitled to in the distribution of profits. Castiglione had ripped off almost every partner at some point, obviously a gambling instinct of his. He couldn't help it. Because the Soviet Union was demanding damages, Castiglione was confronted with enormous recovery demands. He therefore took out loans from several banks, first and foremost Deutsche Bank. As security, he pledged all the BMW shares he still owned. The banks took advantage of this emergency situation. Rumors were deliberately spread to push the share price down. Castiglione's shares went into freefall. He was trapped in debt. And that's when the bank said, Castiglione, you have to hand over your shares to us and additionally scrape together the rest of your money to pay us out. For Castiglione, the fight for his last BMW property was hopeless. His big adversary on the supervisory board was a Deutsche Bank manager 
Rudolf Weidenhammer. The later Nazi industrial boss stood out as an anti-Semitic agitator against Castiglione. BMW Director General Pop, who had profited from the hidden profit distributions, also stabbed Castiglione in the back. Even years later, Castiglione was extremely angry at Franz Josef Pop for more or less forcing him out of BMW. At the end of October 1929, Castiglione had to sell his entire BMW share package. He also had to give up the famous three Baroque paintings in the stairwell of his Viennese palace. He sold the theater in the Josefstadt to Max Reinhardt. Now all that remained for him was to be notified in writing of his expulsion from BMW. Ryan. Ah, Herr Dr. Nelken. Es geht, Herr Präsident. Bitte sehr. Ist mit diesem Abkommen die leidige Angelegenheit mit BMW erledigt oder nicht? Die Sache ist abgeschlossen, Herr Präsident. Leider sitzen wir zurzeit am kürzeren Ast. Aber wir können die Sache natürlich juristisch anfechten. Die Herren von BMW und der Deutschen Bank sind ein hinterhältiges Pack nach all dem, was ich geleistet habe. Vielen Dank, Herr Doktor. Bitte sehr, Herr Präsident. Auf Wiedersehen. Before his dispute at BMW, Castiglione had stirred up the music and theatre scene. Together with Max Reinhardt, he had also been active in Salzburg. In 1928, the Salzburg Festival was on its way to a new deficit, but Castiglione could still prove that he was not finished financially. Because he was spending a lot of money on the Salzburg Mozart Team, where important festival concerts took place. He had the Mozarteum renovated. The large hole in the Mozarteum was even called the Castiglione Hall then, but no longer today. He tried to do a great deal with Max Reinhardt. Castiglione was therefore there when Reinhardt and the everyman poet Hugo von Hofmannsthal came up with a bold plan. A private financial consortium was to take over and restructure the loss-making Salzburg Festival. In 1929, Castiglione himself even got talked about as the saviour of the festival. But the Salzburg governor, Franz Rehl, pulls the ripcord. He sees the danger of a scheduled dictatorship. In politics, there was a rethinking process. The financing of the festival was secured by annual grants. This meant that the millionaire was out of the picture as a patron of the arts. Castiglione's defeats colored the ideal world at Lake Grindelsee. The crisis of the Castiglione's marriage began. In 1916, Iphigenia married a very interesting man who was charming, had a lot of money, and could offer her a wonderful life. As soon as Castiglione had no more money and had to flee permanently from his taxes and creditors, he was no longer the man she had married, and it was no longer the life she wanted to lead. Camillo, weich mir ständig aus. Wir müssen reden. Worüber? Über uns. So kann es nicht weitergehen mit dir in deinen Geschäften und den ganzen Schulden. Ich halte es nicht mehr aus. Du sagst immer, dass du mich liebst. Daran hat sich nichts geändert, mein Schatz. Ja, dann wirst du sicher verstehen, dass ich wieder das tun will, was ich kann. Ich möchte wieder auf eigenen Beinen stehen und zurück auf die Bühne oder zum Film. Vielleicht nimmt mich der Max Reinhardt ja mal mit auf eine Tournee nach Amerika. Und wie stellst du dir das mit den Kindern vor?
there was a solution found for the daughter's education. Yolanda and Livia were sent to a school in Milan. Iphigenia and Camilo, who worked as a financial consultant, now also lived there. There was no talk of a separation of the pair, but Iphigenia was increasingly going her own way. In April 1934, Iphigenia celebrated a successful stage comeback after an 18-year career break. Where? In the theatre in the Josefstadt, which Castiglione bought back from Max Reinhardt in 1935. By this time, the Nazis had already been in power in Germany for two years. They turned BMW back into an armaments company. Car production had receded into the background. Castiglione wasn't deterred by this. He demanded compensation for the BMW kick-out. With his million-dollar lawsuit, however, he took a nosedive. Of course, the political situation was such that Castiglione would never have had a chance to get even one Reichsmark. At the beginning of 1935, Iphigenia had had enough of living with her Camilo. Auction dates and court cases had been irritating her. She set off with a theatre company around Max Reinhardt and Helena Timig for an American guest performance. Iphigenia took her older daughter Livia with her and her younger daughter Yolanda she left with Camilo in Italy. He thought that his wife would come back after the tour. But the 40-year-old got a supporting role in Hollywood. After her Hollywood debut, Iphigenia didn't make any effort to return home. In 1937, the Grondelsee Villa was finally sold to a Swiss businessman. And so Castiglione was left more or less on his own. How much he really suffered from it remains a question. Castiglione coped pretty well with all kinds of situations. In spring 1938, Castiglione reacted to the German invasion of Austria with a clever move. He gave the Josefstadt Theater a new operating company. Only his Italian confidants were in on it. Thus the Nazis couldn't take the theater away from him for the time being because Hitler's Germany was allied with Italy. Castiglione got really nervous because of the political radicalization in Italy. Benito Mussolini also introduced racial laws in 1938. These also applied to Italians of Jewish descent with a fascist party book. Castiglione had one since 1935, so he wanted to know where he stood now as a Christian baptized Jew. Camillo stayed there because of his business. He trusted that he would not be persecuted because he knew Mussolini. There are letters from his uncle to Mussolini asking him for protection. But the Dusha dropped his former donor. So Castiglione and his daughter Yolanda set off for Switzerland in 1940. Here he wanted to build the country's first oil refinery. He tried to emigrate to the USA, but this plan didn't work out, and the refinery project involved him in a bribery scandal. Therefore, he had to leave Switzerland in May 1943 and return to Italy, where he found shelter in a sanatorium. Mussolini was overthrown at the end of July. 
Italy withdrew from the alliance with Hitler. Because the Allies landed in the south, the German Wehrmacht occupied northern and central Italy. Now the Nazis could hunt Jews here as well. Since a series of inflammatory articles against him, Castiglioni knows that the Nazis are after him. In September 1943, Castiglioni therefore fled to San Marino, the tiny republic not far from the Italian Adriatic resort of Rimini. Hundreds of foreign Jews fled to San Marino at that time. The dwarf state had a fascist leadership, but it was determined not to extradite the immigrants. The San Marinese were brave and courageous. They hid the escaped Jews and didn't allow themselves to be caught. The rescue operation was that the government remained silent and the immigrants were provided with forged papers. Castiglione was disguised as a monk and disappeared into a Franciscan monastery. And Alfredo Cesare, the abbot of the convent, held a protecting hand over him and other Jews in the convent. The grey financial juggler, Camillo Castiglione, became the friar Giuseppe Cialenti. He befriended the local dentist and became a welcome guest in the family home. He had this stick with a silver knob, and he supported his head on the stick. And then he talked to us with his eyes half closed. Then, in late autumn 1943, German troops penetrated neutral San Marino. Castiglione believed that the Nazis had tracked him down. When the SS drove up near the monastery, Castiglione lost his nerve. He panicked and wanted to throw himself out of the window so as not to fall into the hands of the Germans. He saw two or three German soldiers coming in, and he was actually determined to jump right out of the window. But at the last moment, a monk held him back and calmed him down. It was also said that the Franciscans used a trick during the house search. They took him to the morgue room and laid him out like a corpse, with candles all around, and pretended he was dead. And the people who came to look for him left without having accomplished anything. After the Nazis had left, it turned out that on that day they were actually after fleeing British prisoners of war, and not after Castiglione. The incident, however, did little to change Castiglione's desire to take risks. Again and again he took a taxi from San Marino to Rimini. Here he could tap into old bank accounts because he still had enough money to pay for food transports to San Marino and the repair of the monastery windows. People often still talk about this phantom-like monk with silk stockings who was extremely polite and attracted attention with his aristocratic behavior. In 1944, San Marino is drawn into the fights between the Allies and the German Wehrmacht. Behind the monastery walls, Castiglione survived this phase as well, until the Second World War was over and the survival artist Giuseppe Cialenti, alias Camillo Castiglione, no longer needed a disguise. In the first post-war years, Castiglione lived as a financial advisor in this house in Milan. In San Marino, he participated in a casino. In 
made a career as an actress in Hollywood during the war years. Her daughter, Livia, was Max Reinhardt's assistant until his death. Livia and her mother then lived in California. Iphigenia had practically built her own life in the USA. She also remarried. Iphigenia's new husband was the actor Leonid Kinsky, who played the bartender in the Humphrey Bogart classic Casablanca. Castiglione's private life was a shambles. Professionally, however, he could show off for the last time. In 1948, in communist Yugoslavia, head of state Tito broke away from the Soviet Union. Tito commissions Castiglione as mediator to get Western aid loans. He traveled to America and was involved in successful negotiations. The USA supplied food and gave the regime in Belgrade a $40 million credit. Castiglione demanded a fat commission for this, but Tito didn't pay. In truth, the Yugoslavs broke their word, and Castiglione sued the Yugoslav state. He also had Yugoslav assets seized in Italy. This coup d'etat put a strain on relations between the two countries. When Castiglione won the trial, he had the upper hand. In 1953, Italy satisfied Castiglione with an advance payment in order to sweeten the climate of talks with Tito. Even before that, the millionaire in Austria had two possessions returned, the theater in the Josefstadt and the palace in Prince Eugenstrasse, which had been damaged by a bomb. During the Nazi era, both houses had finally been transferred to the municipality of Vienna. After Castiglione had paid off the outstanding debts, he could turn his real estate into money. In 1953, Castiglione moved from Milan to Rome. Here, the former financial king was staying in a brand new apartment. He nevertheless afforded himself a butler. At noon, Castiglione was often fed by relatives. I can remember that my uncle Camillo enjoyed a very good pastry from my mother, a sponge cake roll with apricot jam. Whenever she went to visit him, she always brought him the pastry he liked. Uncle Camillo also came to us for lunch. Castiglione spent his last Christmas with the family of his grandniece in 1956. He is said not to have mourned BMW in his table talks. After the Second World War, the company was also heavily in debt. It was not until 1960 that the company began to rise to the status of a global corporation. The merits of the controversial co-founder were forgotten. Castiglione actually saved BMW three times in the early 1920s, at a time when nobody else believed in the company. Not to mention that without Castiglione, BMW would probably not be building any cars today. Uncle Camillo was able to profit from the time in which he lived, and made a large fortune with the new technologies of that time airplanes and cars. It is often said that Camilla was unscrupulous and only looked to his advantage. Well, when he could, he was also very generous. On the 18th of December, 1957, Camillo Castiglioni died of pneumonia in Rome. If you look at Camillo Castiglioni without prejudice, you can say he was a genius, a megalomaniac and an adventurer. But above all, he was a fighter who never gave up. Castiglione was a character who grew up in extreme times and would certainly have had no meaning in normal, quiet times. What would have happened if Castiglione had slowed down his financial gambler nature in the early 1920s 
and been satisfied with his company ownership at that time. Then there would still be a Castiglione group today.